I would go back to the junior golfer who maybe was throwing temper tantrums and was expecting too much of himself and just being like, hey, just be happy you're out there and you can do this. Um, so yeah, I would say gratitude would be my main message to that younger player. Today on The Tournament Code, we're joined by John Sherman. John is the owner of Practical Golf, a website dedicated to helping the everyday golfer. John has written multiple books, including 101 Mistakes Every Golfer Makes and The Four Foundations of Golf. John is a scratch golfer and regularly competes in amateur tournaments in the New York metro area. appreciate you taking the time to join us today, John. For those that don't know about you tell them a little bit more a about just practical golf and then before practical golf how you even got into golf so the long the long and short of it was i was uh like many people who got into golf i I was a sports fanatic as a kid played every sport basketball baseball football hockey everything and when i was 12 found an old set of golf clubs in my grandmother's garage hit a ball struck it purely and i got hooked um so in terms of the context of of my my playing ability for the show i i was an okay high school golfer i was i was a captain of a mediocre golf team i was not a standout golfer at that point probably a maybe a four or five handicap at my best walked on to a division three golf team my my coach was forced to play me in one tournament I actually finished second, got a trophy for that. And that was the end of my college playing career. Um, And then I would call myself a late bloomer competitively. I started practical golf about eight years ago just to share my journey, getting better at golf, competing. Um, So, yeah, I think I have a fairly promising mid-amateur career at this point. Um, I try to coach people from a player's perspective on practical golf. Um, We now have our podcast, The Sweet Spot, and my book, The Four Foundations of Golf, which is kind of a collection of my philosophy. But yeah, so I'm I'm out there as a guinea pig, playing, learning, putting my game under pressure, and and trying to help everyone else with with what I learn and what I'm witnessing in other golfers. So that's uh, that is me in a nutshell. Perfect. I think that's a good spot for us to dive into exactly what practical golf has done and then the culminate i wouldn't say the culmination but close to the culmination of a lot of those philosophies ironing them out in your book the four foundations tell us a little bit about what it was like growing practical golf and what you were what it was like experimenting on yourself with that and then kind of how the book came about so i think you know, when I started the site, my, my main uh, thought was, well, what what can I do? You know, there's plenty of stuff on the golf swing out there. Every Everywhere you look, the, you know, growing up, swing tips and magazines. Uh, I'm a little older than you guys, so the, the internet wasn't around for golf tips. Fortunately, when I was a teenager, we didn't have YouTube. I know that dates me a little bit, but, um, you know, I looked around and this is 2015 and I was like, you know, there's just everything still about the swing. So I'm like, what, what else can I talk about that I think is important strategy, how to practice effectively, um, the mental game and, and most importantly, how can I be a happier golfer? How can I manage my expectations? And I started writing about that on the site. I wrote hundreds of articles and that slowly built up an audience. And through that process, I saw what was helping people. I paid attention to the feedback. I got better as a coach. I learned from other coaches I got better as a player in competition and eventually that's what that's how the four foundations came about those were the four topics i felt that i had the most expertise in and i can communicate um the most with and felt that was impacting golfers the most um so yeah it, there wasn't many people paying attention in the beginning luckily the book you know because i was able to package it all neatly in the book that that's really i think taken what I'm doing to another level now, thankfully. Um, but yeah, those are the four topics that I, I focus on pretty much exclusively. And outside of that, um, I leave it to people who know more about those topics than me. That's a great thing that you've put together. I've read four foundations and as we've kind of discussed, I've played a decent bit of golf in my life. And even for me, like just going through it, it was a good reminder on a lot of fronts and, uh, I've, you know, you see a lot of tweets where people tweet, you know, I've played my, I played my best golf after reading uh, this <laughs> book. And I I think there's a lot of 
truth in it, at least for me, it kind of reminded me to focus on the things that I needed to focus on. So those four foundations, expectation management, strategy, practice, and then mental game. Um, those, those foundations are important to golf, but especially I think the one that gets lost the most is expectation management. I think that you see it with a lot of the tweets that like Lou Stagner comes out with, or a lot of our friends who are focused on the data. It's very easy to forget that like golf is hard. You're hitting a small ball in a hole with a stick that you're swinging over a hundred miles per hour. It's just not easy. So, uh, and that's something I noticed in not just my own game, I'd get frustrated and now I've worked on tempering that, but in like other people I play with would get unreasonably angry. Uh, there's a guy I played with who was a two handicap and I've never heard a guy get so mad after every single 20 footer he missed. He'd, he'd be saying like GD this GD that like over and over and over, uh, and on 20 footers. And I would look at it and I'd be like, man, I don't feel like you were supposed to make that one. So all that to say, I really like what you've put together in this book. Can you walk us through kind of, if possible, like your philosophies of the, each part of the, those foundations? Uh, sure. Do you have 10 hours? Hey, no, yeah. <laughs> As you said, it's a long book. Um, I think, you know, expectation management is, is the one now that I've got gotten a lot of feedback from the book, I think that, and I, I purposefully put it in the first section. And that I think has made the most impact on golfers just because it's it's taken the pressure off. It's added enjoyment back to the game, something that I suffered with for a really long time. And there's a few ways to connect with people on that topic. One of them is through statistics, just showing people, you know, what are some PGA tour stats? The one that gets a lot of attention is, you know, when a tour player is, you know, a hundred yards away with a wedge in the fairway, they're not putting it to five feet every time. And if, if a normal golfer hits it to 30 feet on the green, that's an excellent result. So I think a lot of people look at some basic stats that I share and are like, oh, I'm actually better than I think. And, and someone like Lou Stagner, for example, goes way more in depth because he has far more uh, numerical ability than me, I'll say. Um, but I think that's one way to do it. Another way is I have shared embarrassing stories about myself and some of my lowest points in golf where I went out with this make or break proposition where it said, you know, I'm either going to shoot this score that I think is good for me. And if I don't, I'm going to be unhappy with the day. And that was a really bad way to play golf. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, I got to spend some time with people who read the book this weekend at, at a Chasing Scratch event. We were talking about those guys before we started recording. So I got to hear from some people who read the book and that section was the one everyone talked about is like, wow, I'm going out and I'm like, I'm placing my emphasis on fun. No matter what happens out there, I'm going to have a good time. If I hit it like crap, you know, I'm still going to find a way to derive happiness from this experience. And that's hard to do in this game. Um, so yeah, that that's really the main point of the managing expectations section is you know, what is your relationship with golf going to be? How do you react to shots? Most of them are better than you think. Um, and most importantly, you know, why are you playing the game? Because <laughs> I think we, we lose sight of that in the heat of battle. Um, so yeah, that, that one is, that's the foundation of the foundations, I would say. If you don't get that part right, that none of it else works. Perfect. And then moving on to those other foundations, as far as with each one, what Again, you, I know it's hard to bring a whole book into a few sentences or something like that, but with each one, I know like with uh, practicing, you focus just like uh, Adam Young does. I listen to your podcast, just like you guys focus on there, like more about skill acquisition than maybe, I know block practice versus random practice is a very contentious area uh, <laughs> in the golf world. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a silly debate in my opinion, but it's become one. Uh, it's, there's nothing like a good debate over semantics. Uh, so like that can be a debate, but as far as like when it comes to practice, you focus a lot on, you know, skill acquisition and like spraying the driver face. That's something we learned from, I remember Adam Young might've been doing it prior, but I would know like Andrew Rice, we first learned that from him like 10 years ago or something like that. And each little area has something unique that is very focused on um, being effective over time, spending time out there. So can you walk us through those other three and kind of what small little um, blurbs you can give on that to give people an understanding of 
the general philosophy under each? So I think, you know, our instincts as golfers when we practice is to play amateur swing doctor. You know, we're on the range and the puzzle that we're trying to solve is like, well, what can I do in my golf swing to make that golf ball fly straighter? And then a lot of it defaults to, you know, what I used to do sometimes and be like, oh, maybe I need to shorten my swing. Maybe I need to get my, you know, wrists moving in this direction. And then we're, we're caught in that kind of this endless, I call it like a changing lanes in a traffic jam where we're trying to make these technical adjustments to the swing and, or, you know, worse, we're getting swing tips every week from a buddy or on YouTube and it's none of it's coherent. So I'm not against technical changes. I think people should get golf lessons and get customized advice, but let's face it, most golfers don't. Um, so what I try and focus on in the book and what I talk about, and certainly, you know, I, I've, I've learned a lot from Adam and share the similar philosophy is more the impact fundamentals and the skills that golf asks you to master, which is, can you strike it towards the center of the face? Can you control where the face is pointing at impact and make a functional relationship with the club path? So, you know, I'm not someone who, I haven't looked at my golf swing in years. I don't video it. I haven't taken lessons in a long time. I got a lot out of those lessons, but I'm someone who looks at my ball flight and works backwards saying, that ball started too far to the right. My face was too open. What can I do as an athlete to make that adjustment. And a lot of the practice methods I discuss in the book ask that question of golfers just to give you some ideas of, you know, how to spend that time more productively. I talk about things like swing tempo. Um, we just had an episode with tour tempo on our podcast that I, I think will help people. So I'm trying to give these, what I believe are more productive methods to spend your practice time, your limited practice time to solve the questions that golf is asking you. Golf is not asking you to have a certain swing aesthetic. It's asking you to hit the ball in somewhat of a close area of your target. And I'd rather people try and make adjustments or think about the impact fundamentals that solve that rather than again, the, the random swing stuff, because it just, I, I just don't believe it works for most golfers. So um, there's a lot of different ways I give solutions to that problem. Um, you know, whether it's spraying the face, Adam's done that. Andrew Rice has done that for a long time. I think a lot of golfers have, I used to put masking tape on my irons when I was a teenager. Um, that's how I saw where I was striking it on the face. Um, now it's much easier with Dr. Scholes. But yeah, there's a lot of little things you can do and understanding the ball flight laws and working backwards that I think can just make that 30, 45 minutes you have more productive um, and focus on the right thing. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not about the golf swing to me. There's plenty of people can help you with that. It's more about what can you do to challenge yourself as an athlete in, in those practice sessions and solve those problems and then bring it out to the course, hopefully, those little internal feels you're getting, those reference points. So on your website, in your bio, it, it says that you conquered every major scoring milestone through your golf career you know that being you broke 100 90 80 and then 70 and now you're a scratch golfer so at what point in that progression did you start to realize the four major things that you teach or was it sort of a little bit at each stage in the progression yeah i think i think for a lot of golfers as their handy get handicaps get lower there's different things holding them back um, so for me, you know, when you get down to one, two level, you know, going from a one or two to zero doesn't sound like much, but those who have been to that level know that that last stroke or two are getting to a plus handicap. There's, there's a big difference in, in performance. And, and the one skill that I believe is holding, what's holding me back and many other golfers is, is really face control. Um, and what I mean by that is controlling where the golf club is pointing at impact is it too open or too closed i think that is ultimately the biggest variable in everyone's golf swing whether it's a tour pro or an amateur is every day you're showing up with a different um face presentation and that you know your face is too open or closed that's how you hit those big drives that go out of bounds that's how you miss greens um certainly where you're striking it on the face and ground contact and other stuff are more important but i think that's the one that is holding a lot of golfers back because if you can't drive it well, 
you can't keep it in play off the tee. You're already behind the eight ball. And, and then, then it, it's much harder to manufacture a score for the rest of the hole. So for me, my driver was holding me back. I needed to figure out how can I keep that ball in play off the tee so that I can take advantage of my skill as an iron player, which was always quite high. Um, so that led me to a lot of practice methods that were, you know, kind of out of the box and, and doing the opposite of my fault. I have a practice method that I call fight fire with fire, which a lot of people figured out on their own. If I'm hooking the ball too much. I try and slice it. And ultimately that's moving my swing path and face presentation around a bit. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, when you talk about those type of skills in terms of ball striking for sure, face control, and then, and then there's strategic mistakes, learning out, learning, you know, from guys like Scott Fawcett and Mark Brody, what's the optimal strategy that just learning how to control my emotions and getting into a meditative state on the course under pressure in tournaments, whether it was trying to break 80 or 70, like going through those things, I'm figuring out different things that are going on in my head and trying to pay attention to that feedback and get better at it the next time. So yeah, as I progressed from a guy who was like a two, three, four handicap to getting down to scratch. And I've gotten down to like plus two and a half this year at my lowest point. It's all a little bit of everything. And what I've learned, I think can apply to 15 handicaps, 20 handicaps. But yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. I, I probably kind of went on for a bit there, but that's, I'm always, I think feedback is so important in golf. You got to be paying attention to mental feedback impact feedback, strategic feedback, and going back in your rounds and reviewing and then making those adjustments and then finding out the answers to the questions your games are, are asking you. No, I think that's perfect. And one of the things I like that you said there is when it comes to playing in a round, a lot of times you kind of mentioned that it's not about the technicalities. Like it's really most of the time it's a club face issue and you kind of react to where the ball's going as opposed to I can remember we were actually talking with Lainey Fry who qualified for the she plays at University of Kentucky qualified for the U.S. Women's Open this year and she had a breakthrough when she realized you know the problem isn't that I'm out here and I hit a bad shot and the problem isn't oh I need more wrist flexion I need less wrist flexion or something to that extent like at least during the round the problem usually is not a technical thing per se it's usually just about awareness and the variability of being a human swinging a club and so with that in mind when you're out there on the course and the variability of being a a human swinging a club happens to you how do you try to react to that so you're on the tee and you hit a shot that um goes a little too far right um cuts right or something that of that nature how do you try to react to that and gauge? Do you like immediately react to the result or do you wait to see if it becomes a pattern over time? That That's exactly. And that's the hardest distinction to make. You know, Adam and I talk a lot about that on our podcast is when do you, what's the difference between the inherent variability of golf and then what's a pattern? So I would say for me, you know, if you're paying attention to your ball flight and your tendencies and really, really internalizing that feedback after each round, then you're going to start to pick up on trends in your game. And when it does go wrong, what happens? So for me, for example, off the tee, my tendency now is if I'm going to lose it right, it's either a heel strike, which will impart more left to right spin on it for me because of gear effect, or potentially I'm leaving the face too open. So I could feel that at impact. If I hit it off the heel and see that ball flight, I'm like, okay, you healed that one. Or if I struck it well and I left the face open, it's a big block. All right, there's a difference between the two. One's a face angle issue and the other's an impact location issue. And sometimes maybe it's a mixture of both. So I don't panic when it happens. Of course, I'm going to miss some tee shots to the right. And of course, I'm going to miss some tee shots to the left. However, if I'm seeing a pattern on three, four tee shots, then I have to reach into my what I would call internal library to make an adjustment. Sometimes if it's the heel strike, I just consciously try and strike the toe. I know that sounds ridiculous and simple or I line it more out towards the toe. Um, Or if I deem it a face angle issue, I'm going to consciously try and close the face a bit. Or maybe I'm hooking it too much and I believe that's a swing path issue. I'll try and hit a slice swing. Doesn't always work, but I think you know, again, it's, it's understanding the tendencies of your game. You know, some golfers, if they go up there and they're constantly making adjustments, that's not good. So you want to pick and choose your spots and really look for 
that pattern when it shows up. But sometimes like, yeah, it's just, you have to accept that, you know, maybe today I'm going to be, you know, for me now, sometimes it's a fade off the tee and I'm going to have to play that fade um, and just work with it. So yeah, it's, it's a really difficult question to solve, but you can't solve it unless you're paying attention and also in practice looking for solutions to those problems. Like if you're a toe striker, what can you do to move that impact closer to the center of the face? If you're pulling the ball, can you find a feel that opens the face more? If it's a slice, can you neutralize that out to in swing path? And then you bring those fixes out on the course, hopefully. Um, that's like the never ending question of, of golf, really. That's why it's such an awesome game is because no one ever solves it. The pros are dealing with that, too. That is some really good stuff. And definitely if people know these type of things, then they will definitely be able to help themselves on the course. But I'd like you to explain gear effect for some of the listeners who may not know what that is. Um, it, it's it's fairly simple. Uh, you can go on the Tuttleman Golf site if you'd like a very deep physics uh, explanation. So it, it really only occurs in in clubs where the center of gravity is very far away from the face. What do I mean by that? Usually a you know, hybrid fairway wood or driver. The, the, an iron, the, the center of gravity is right next to the face, so you're not going to get gear effect. So for a right-handed golfer, all things being equal, if you strike it on the heel, it will impart more slice left to right spin on the ball. Um, and if you hit it on the toe, it will put more draw spin on it. If you hit it lower on the face where the loft is actually decreased, um, it will launch it lower and spin it more. If you hit it higher on the face where the loft of the club is actually increased, the loft changes on your driver face. It's, it's, it's called, uh, I believe that's the roll part and bulges the horizontal if I'm remembering correctly. So if you hit it higher on the face, it increases launch and lower spin, which is actually good for a lot of golfers. So for me, um, I don't play that big of a draw anymore, but hitting it on the heel is a good matchup for me because sometimes, let's say I had a very into out path on a shot, but I strike it on the heel, it kind of counteracts and I can actually hit it straight or a slight fade. Whereas if I was a toe striker with an into out pattern, that would be bad news for me because I'm going to hit more dramatic hooks. So matchups are really important in golf and gear effect can play into that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's one of those things where if you're not tracking impact location, when you practice, a lot of people think they, they sliced it or hooked it because of their swing path. And it actually might've been a, a healer or a toe strike. So it's something you have to pay attention to. And once you learn what a heel strike feels like and what a toe strike feels like, and you see that ball flight, so many people are like, oh God, like that's a light, a light bulb goes off. And that's, you know, a lot of people have been talking about this, like Andrew Rice and Adam Young were certainly one of the early ones. Um, it's just a great thing to learn about and, and keep track of while you practice. And then more importantly on the course. So yeah, gear effect is, it can be tricky because a lot of golfers don't understand why the golf ball is curving through the air the way it does. That makes sense. One of the things I had a question about jumping back to a little bit earlier was you, you said something that I thought was really important, which is you kind of got to define what your relationship is with golf and what it's going to be. And I know for me, I can tell you golf when I played competitively was a very frustrating game because there was, there's no perfection in it. And, uh, especially when you have misaligned expectations it can be really tough. And one of the, one of the themes, uh, the last question we ask every guest is what, if you go back to yourself as a junior golfer and tell yourself one thing, what would it be? Uh, we, that's our last question. And the majority of the answers are something revolving around the theme of like, enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's so funny to hear that from people. This is for people who are actively playing and from people who are no longer playing. And it's a good reminder. I think to us, um, the, if we're not, if we're not focused on actively enjoying it, if we haven't defined how, what our relationship is with golf, it can take over us. And then we can end up in this cycle of being mad and not being good enough and not enjoying the time we spend out there. It's either a success. Um, and very rarely is there ever success in a golfer's mind because you always could do better or it's a failure of a day. Uh, so with that in mind, Tell us a little bit about how you define your relationship with golf and what you've kind of learned going from walking on in college to 
stopping playing to picking back up and getting more and more competitive? Yeah, so I think absolutely, you know, enjoyment and happiness are the two words that come to mind. I think the trap that I fell into and a lot of other players in the context of competition is that you let the score define your enjoyment of the day. Was it a success or failure? And even worse, it it can get down to like, not to be melodramatic, it can make you feel like less good as a person too. You know, I've, I've had days and I know plenty of other people have competed, had days where you shoot a score and you, you really feel bad about yourself. It kind of like rattles you to your core and you kind of bring that funk around with you into the rest of your life, which is quite unfortunate, but it is one of the risks of playing competitively. Um, whereas now, uh, you know, I, I, I'm lucky to live, you know, I live in the New York metro area and we have the MGA, which is, I believe, one of the best amateur golf uh, associations in the country. And we, we have all these major events. So I get to play a really full tournament schedule. Um, you know, I always try uh, two years in a row, been very close to getting into the US Mid-Am. So I, I've gotten my game better and better in tournaments. And the one thing that I've realized that gives me comfort and I think hopefully can give other golfers comfort is that it doesn't matter. (laughs) And I mean that in a few different ways. Like I worry about, oh, if you shoot a crappy score, what are my friends going to think? Or like, what am I going to think about myself? It it literally doesn't matter. You are out there. I'm not playing professionally. I'm never going to go pro. I'm not good enough. And if, if that's the case, then this is truly a leisurely pursuit. And leisure is supposed to be for some type of internal satisfaction and enjoyment. Um, So I don't go out in these tournaments, you know, thinking like I have to shoot 68 today or else it's a failure. I go out there with a neutral expectation. I'm going to have fun with my playing partners. I'm going to enjoy this cool course I get to play today. And I'm going to go through my routine and give every shot the attention it deserves. And if I play poorly, that is the variance of golf. If I play really well, then yeah, I'll feel good about that too. But no matter what, as hard as it is to do, I will not consider the day a failure either way. I still got to play golf. And there's other things I could have been doing that were less fun than that. Um, And that's, you know, I play a lot of competitions throughout the year and I'm paired with a lot of other golfers. Like that's the biggest struggle for us all is like, how can we walk off the course and not feel badly about ourselves if we played poorly? It's it's really hard to do. Yeah. To speak to that, I don't think, you know, you're being melodramatic at all. I think me and Daniel (laughs) have both felt, felt, um, worse about ourselves after a bad score and i think you said it perfectly that is the risk that you take playing competitive golf um i've seen a lot of people feel that way um in addition to myself but what do you think is the best thing someone can do to have a better perspective if they're feeling this way well i think the first question you ask yourself is like why am i doing this Right. Um, if you're doing it to like show off to other people in the fields that you're going to beat them and like a, you're like a hardcore competitor that way, like that, you know, you can do that. But that's, I, I think, going to lead to more unhappiness in the long run. So I, I, I try and reflect after all these events and and I keep asking myself the same question, like, is this enjoyable to me? And in the beginning, when I had some really bad results that really shot, shook me to my core, I'm like, thought to myself, maybe I should be doing this. Maybe competitive golf isn't like, I don't recommend it for a lot of golfers. It can really ruin your enjoyment of the game. Um, but I stuck with it and I got better at it. And I, I think I'm at a happy medium now where I just try to evaluate. Like if I feel like sometimes during the summer, like in this summer, I felt myself getting burnt out. And I withdrew from a couple of events um, because I was like, you know, this is starting to feel like I'm forcing myself to do this. And it takes a lot of mental energy to go through these rounds. And, you know, maybe I'll just play some rounds of my course with my friends and have fun. So, you know, depending on how well I do in certain tournaments throughout the year, you know, you get into bigger ones and you're playing practice rounds. So it becomes a big time commitment if you're really into these things. And then eventually at some point I'll say like, okay, I'm going to have to hit the pause button for a bit because I'm, I'm getting burnt out and I, I shouldn't be getting burnt out from something that should be fun. So I'm constantly asking myself that question. Is this fun? Is this fun? Is this fun? Um, and that's the best thing that I could do. And like, yeah, when you play well and like 
you get the good results. Like it's like a drug to be quite honest. Like I'm friends with a lot of people around here who compete. We've all, you know, you see the same guys at events and we're all like, we're all junkies. We're chasing like that sensation when you're coming down the stretch and you're like feeling the pressure. And I I now enjoy that and I'm chasing that feeling. But again, I, in the context of having fun, um, that's the number one thing. Again, if you're, if you feel like you should be doing it or something like that, or it's, it's, it's taking you down a notch mentally, like then it's like, well, why? (laughs) I was, you know, why? I don't know. People are different. So it's hard for me to say like, what would motivate someone to play competitively versus someone else. But that's, that's the solution I've found for myself that works. Like it's gotta be fun. Right. Well, I, you know, Daniel said in a previous episode, he's like, it's much, it's very similar to, um, like gambling, like, you know, if you, oh, yeah. if you're at a casino gambling, you know, you get that rush, you win, you feel great. Yep. Um, but if you don't win, you feel terrible. And I just going, thinking about the successes that I have had in golf, it's almost like the same exact thing. It's like, you feel so good. It's like nothing can bring you down. And I guess that's what, you know, keeps bringing you back to to competitive golf the big breakthrough i had about three or four years ago um because you know if you play these events whether it's like a qualifier to get into a bigger event or if it's something like a one day thing like the u.s mid-am qualifier when you tee off and you're like well i got to shoot one or two under today to make this like you know the number i found that when i stopped and again this is very cliched um but i think it works when i stopped caring about the results so much Like if I put the result on a pedestal too much, then those final five or six holes, it would be in my mind before every shot versus when I finally learned to like let go and say, if I make it great and if I don't, you know, I'm going to go home and my kids aren't going to care either way. My wife's not going to care either way. Like who, like legitimately who cares other than you? Like it's not that big of a deal. And that freed me up big time where, you know, the last two years I, I, got very hot coming down the stretch at the U S mid-am qualifier and almost made it both years in a row and just ran out of holes. I didn't make it. And yeah, is that a failure quote? Yeah, I guess it's a failure because I didn't make it, but I got super close and feeling that feeling that excitement coming down the stretch and being okay with either result was just awesome to me. And I didn't, I was excited coming off. I'm like, all right, I didn't make the playoff for the last spot, but you know what? I'm putting myself in the mix now. And maybe one of these days it's going to happen. Um, and that's a more extreme result because that, that's a very difficult tournament to get into. But even at the lower events that I play, it's, that's how I've removed the pressure coming down the stretch is saying like, you're, you're legitimately going to be okay either way. And it frees me up to just kind of enjoy the moment and hit the shots and live with the results. Um, and that is, yeah, that gets tested every time for sure. It's easier said than done. About a couple months ago i was i played in the first tournament that i had played in in like probably four or five months and i i felt those nerves coming down the stretch it was a two it was a not a big deal it was a two-man tournament with a buddy but i just felt the pressure of coming down the stretch and i had this realization after the round i was like normal people don't ever get to feel that feeling of being you know in the hunt of of a golf tournament it doesn't matter what tournament it is But, um, it was just interesting to, I guess, have an outsider's perspective because I've been used to feeling that for so long, but, you know, not knowing that it it wasn't something that normal people don't feel. Yeah. I think it's one of those things where, um, that could be a bad thing for someone's relationship for, with golf, or it could be a good thing. Um, Again, I don't, you know, people are wired differently and what they want out of it. And, and, and pressure is relative in this game. Some people feel more pressure on the first tee, you know, at a local Muni teeing off in front of 20 people than, you know, probably I feel coming down the stretch in a tournament now. It's just because I've done it so many times and I'm more comfortable in the moment. I, my hands aren't shaking anymore. I'm just like, you know what? I've been, it's, it's not uncharted territory and I'm more comfortable failing or succeeding. Uh, either way and maybe those aren't the right words but yeah the but that that little tinge of excitement that you feel it's like yeah i'm in the mix like that's i've grown to like it um 
I think some people, it, they might not like it. And yeah, I, I, I think, honestly, I think hardcore competitive golf is only for a small percentage of, of recreational players. Um, I think it really can wreck people's relationship with the game. Um, and then the, the, the people who do get hooked on it, maybe they're a little weird because they're chasing that thing. I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure yet. I'm still trying to figure that out. That's the truth. Uh, we were talking the other day, I think with Ryan Moke and I said, we were talking specifically, I was thinking about one of our buddies who will be on here in a bit, Ashton Van Horn. And, uh, I was thinking, you know, at every level you go up, like everybody's a little bit more messed up at each yeah. level. Like <laughs> and when it comes to that level, like Ashton, Ashton, again, I, when I picked golf back up, I sucked, uh, during law school and Ashton was actually pissed at me. I shot like 92 one day playing with him and he was more pissed at me than I was at myself. Cooper, <laughs> Cooper was there. Like he's losing it. Like, he's like, like, what are you, come on, Daniel. I'm like, I don't know, man. Like I just hit the ball around and I try to find it. And like, sometimes it's a good day. Sometimes it's a bad day. Uh, so when it gets to that higher level, I think guys are definitely messed up. And I think part of it might, um, be contributed to by the concept you talked about, you know, failure and success and that you're talking about qualifying for the man. And you're like, I didn't do it. So I ran out of hole. So maybe that was a failure. And at least maybe the framework I have, um, is incorrect, but what I do in my head is I kind of think about and everything like poker to an extent. And sometimes, you know, you have good hands, uh, and sometimes, you know, you don't have good hands. So right now, like I'm not playing, I'm playing a decent bit. I'm getting better, but I know I don't really have a great hand. So, so like I might not win the pot or something like that. I might not win the tournament, but I know that, you know, if I like play my hand to the best possible, if I play the best strategy, then like I maximize my chances. And that's about to a degree. That's about all you can ask for. Cause everybody goes into a golf tournament with different hands. Everybody goes in with different skill levels, but the things that don't change are your ability to handle what happens there and your ability to manage your strategy, which is, you know, similar to what Fawcett says, which is, if you get to the end of the round and you're upset at how you played either like your mental game wasn't strong enough or you're not as good as you thought. And exactly. And that's the hardest thing to do is like when you, so if you're playing in some events, like, so for example, the ones we have in the New York Metro area, um, we have a few like big major tournaments. And for me, you know, you play these qualifiers and there's only like six or 12 spots and 60 or 70 guys are going for maybe a hundred trying to get into the big events. We have like the Ike, the Met Amateur, the Long Island Open. It's a pro tournament. So we have a few tournaments around here that have been around for over a hundred years. They're great historical tournaments. And it, when I first started, it was like, okay, I just need to not be nervous playing in this qualifier. And that was like my level that I was going towards. I knew I wasn't good enough to make it yet. And then after a few years, I got comfortable and then I started making it into some of them and I got into the big event and I would be super nervous and I didn't play that well. So, you know, I'm climbing a little bit higher and higher and each time like that level of success was fun for me. So now I'm getting into the big events and, you know, I've got a couple like top 30s, top 20s. I'm not good enough to win these things. You know, we got guys who used to play professionally. Um, we have a guy um, here who's you know, I think he's top 250 in the world in the amateur rankings now. His name's Brad Tilly. Um, you know, he, maybe he can be on a Walker Cup team. He's having a really great run. I'm never going to beat Brad Tilly. <laughs> you know, he's like a plus six. Like, I'm just not going to beat this guy. But me playing in a tournament with him, and like, I think I maybe finished ahead of him in one tournament. I think a couple of years ago, he had a bad day. Um, but I'm not there to win it. I'm there to like, you know, top 30, top 20 is good for me now. Maybe a top 10 is in my future. I don't know. But each level I get to is my skills increasing and my experience is increasing. Therefore, I can have a little bit higher aspirations, but you can't be wild with them because that's that disconnect is where trouble happens. Like, so if I started in these events saying like, well, I want to get through into the Ike and finish in a top 10, of course, I'm not going to do that. That's ridiculous. I have no no experience, nothing. And that's just going to be too much pressure on myself. Um, so I think that's the best way to approach it is I'm, I'm all about incremental progress and having realistic expectations and just being like honest with where your game's at. Um, like, you know, you go to these U S open qualifiers sometimes and you see guys shooting like a hundred and you're like, what are you, what are you doing? Why? Like, what is this? Is this just to say you played in this thing? Um, 
so yeah, there, there's all different levels you can enjoy it at. And there's there's the guys who are out there to win. They're good enough. And and they, they're they just good enough to do that. Um, I'm not good enough to do that right now. Maybe I will be one day. I have no idea. I'd like to find out though. I think it's one of those concepts too that's hard for most golfers to wrap their heads around because it's so antithetical to how almost every other sport is played. Like when you play basketball, like if you play basketball competitively, I did for a while and there is no, it's well ingrained in almost every single sport. There are no emotional, uh, there are no moral victories. And in golf, honestly, sometimes like you just can't win and that's okay. I remember uh, one of our guests won the U.S. four ball, Leo Herrera, back when it was at Chambers Bay. And to do it on the 18th hole, he rolled a 20 footer in and he was like shaking with nerves, kind of like what you yeah. talked about. And like <laughs> part of it, like you see, like he breathed into it, hit it. And it went in, which is partially luck, as we know, just yep. based on like you're putting on a living surface. So um, you can't always gauge things by that, as we've discussed. For you, when you end up in a situation like that where there are nerves and you have some of that shaking going on, how do you, A, react to those nerves? B, also, how do you try to keep everything, keep the results in context and not like say say you miss that 20-footer when you have nerves go on and say, oh, I'm a bad nerves player. Like I can't perform when I have nerves. How do you try to avoid stigmatizing or labeling yourself as that and creating a self-fulfilling prophecy? So the the best thing that I've found, and I think a lot of people have stumbled across this in every sport and golf, it's probably more important because it's a really solitary uh, pursuit. You don't have teammates to rely on or a coach to tell you what to do and rev you up on the sideline. Over the last, you know, however many hundred plus competitive rounds over the last seven years. Like I've been training myself to get into a deeper, deeper, like mental cocoon to the point where like my routine and my, you know, you can call it a walking meditation, mindfulness, whatever. I play songs in my head, anything I can do to distract myself from the thinking about the result, which you said, and bringing myself to the experience. And like, I will literally stare off into the trees, like at the sun, I play songs in my head and I'm, I'm just trying to soak in the experience and, and honestly being grateful for being there. Um, so like I, I just had my club championship, which fortunately I won it this year. And, you know, we have over 200 people watching us. It's a big deal at our club. And the last 36 hole match, you know, there's all these people there. And to be quite honest, like I didn't even see them. I was so intensely focused on what was going in front of me and just in my own little like zone. And of course, like, yeah, I want to win. And I'm thinking about that, but I, like anything, you know, it's different for each person, but anything you could do to bring your focus to like the process of evaluating the shot, hitting it, like with putting, for example, you know, you have certain putts during the round that are like momentum shifters or like a par save or a birdie putt. And you're like, and the instinct is to think about, well, if you miss this, then this is going to happen. And the best thing I've found is that I have such a defined routine on the greens and I'm playing these songs in my head. And it's, it's, it, it, Carl Morris, um, who has a great podcast and I love the term he uses, it's the walking meditation that my whole process of evaluating the, the, the read of it, getting over the ball and right before I'm about to hit, like I'm not. I'm really not trying to think about the result. I'm so distracted by like this routine that it's almost not even occurring to me. Now that doesn't happen every single time, but that helps me a lot under these like moments of extreme pressure where I'm like, what can I do to stop thinking about what's going to happen if I miss this spot? That's the hardest thing to do. And honestly, and and the best thing I've found is like really being okay if the putt doesn't go in. And a lot of that, some people can figure that out through looking at putting statistics or, or understanding that green imperfections and stuff like that. But like just standing over the ball, like knowing if it doesn't go in, that's okay too. Like that f frees me up to allow my body to do what it knows how to do. And like 
Yeah, sometimes, and, and you have to deal with what you can't control. Like, I happened to, my putter got super hot during the club championship. I can't control that. It just happened. A lot of, like, big putts went in, and maybe next year they won't go in, and that's why I lose by a slim margin. Like, a lot of it's, at, or or my opponent's putter gets hot. Like, there's so much that's out of your control, and you have to accept, too, competitively. Whereas, like you mentioned earlier before, in, like, playing basketball or a game like football, it's more about, like, brute force and, like, you know, try or almost like trying harder than your opponent you could physically overcome them like you just can't do that in golf and you have to be okay with like that that lack of control in the game so yeah process is like everyone talks about it but it is that important and finding your own process that i believe brings you back to the singular moment in front of you and not worrying about the future of what could happen whether it's like a win or not a good result and the past which is Sometimes we're thinking about that putt we missed on the fifth hole. It's like, you know, I, I put this in the book. Golf is essentially a battle between the past and the and the future. It really is. And the, the best players find a way to bring themselves to the present. Like everyone has known that on some level for as long as the game has existed. And everyone needs to find their own way to get to the present. And that's one of those things that I like to do. I know you've probably seen uh, the Sam Harris's It Is Always Now video. Um, and I kind of use that as a meditation. I meditate every day, but on top of that, I also listen to that video to kind of remind me like one, it is always now. And two, like there's going to be a lot of things that happen in life where you're going to look back and say, man, I wish I was more present at this moment. I wish I had absolutely like, especially it's always a good reminder. And he says it in there, like, you know, as soon as like a loved one dies, you think, man, like, Maybe I shouldn't have, you know, taken them for granted. Maybe I shouldn't have been a dick at Thanksgiving or something to that effect. Like, Absolutely. And, and for me, like, I think one of the things about enjoyment and fun is like, I don't want to look back on all these competitive rounds and think about like, oh, you, you really folded there under the pressure. It's like, no, you played golf and golf is supposed to be fun. And like, it's, it's really like, for me, it's, it's the stop I, I used to build it up so much in my head what golf was like it was this like mythical pursuit of mine and it's really not it's just this like silly little game that we got obsessed with and as you said like one day it's going to end one may one day my abilities are going to start declining and i think about that as can i enjoy the game then just as much as i am now like as i'm playing my best golf ever you know can i still enjoy it hopefully when i'm in my 70s or 80s when i'm not hitting the ball as far or scoring as low um, that's what I think long and hard about is, is, you know, don't, don't lose yourself in that silliness and that, 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 um, you know, make or break proposition. Like you got to play and you got to feel that pressure. And again, if that, if that was fun for you, like embrace that moment and be okay with like it not working out because it might, it probably won't. And a lot of that's outside of your control. Earlier this year, when I was watching the masters, I noticed that Scotty Scheffler, when he was walking up 18 fairway, about to win the first major of the year, he seemed totally at ease with himself. And it just made me think like, you know, me playing in a tiny mini tour event, I felt way more pressure than at least from what it looked like that he was feeling walking up 18 fairway with the lead at the Masters. And it just made me realize that a lot of the times the pressure and anxiety that you feel is put on by yourself and it's not always the situation itself that makes you feel this way. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and he was it seemed like he was ready to do it, but even he admitted that morning I think he said that he was literally crying to his I was maybe it was his fiance at the time saying like how am I going to do this that morning? And then he came out and I remember he was very shaky. You know, he had a, I remember watching that final round, he had a pull pattern. He was missing, you know, he, he always plays that aim left and rip the fade and it was not fading. He was pulling a ton of shots the first four or five holes and he made an adjustment and he, he fought his way through that to the end and, and probably built confidence throughout the round. Um, and he, he, he figured out and he was probably just ready to do it, but um, I'm sure he was nervous in the beginning of the round and by the end, he probably felt triumphant, but it's it's really all relative. Um, you know, the, the pressure hits everyone differently. 
and a lot of it a lot of it i think is derived from this this fear of embarrassing ourselves like i still have that too like i'll play with people i actually played with people this past weekend at that chasing scratch event people had read my book and listened to the podcast and i had like genuine anxiety going to the event because i was like if i don't you know my own nonsense but like what if i don't play that well and i kind of stink it up like what are these people going to think of me um and just as i met all of them when we became quick friends like that fear melted away um but yeah this game is like i think a lot of it is like we're all just afraid of like embarrassing ourselves in front of each other but we really will eventually all embarrass ourselves because that's what golf does to us cooper and i have had plenty of those experiences uh yeah pl- plenty of them i could there's our, one of my favorite stories i'm not going to go through because we've told it before is long story short north south qualifier uh i'm caddying for cooper make a small uh we make a small uh strategic mistake in the hunt to qualify ends up um double bogeying the hole or something to that extent we go home uh we go back to the hotel in north carolina and i'm ready you know to like lie down, relax. And Cooper says, we're going. Uh, and I said, dude, like we have the hotel for the night. Let's just stay here. It's a seven hour drive home. We're not getting home till midnight. And he said, no, we're going like you're staying either. You're getting uh, some sort of ride home or we're going. <laughs> said, okay. We're going then. And I got in the car and I sw- it, honest to God, there was not a word spoken between us the entire ride. He asked me if I wanted food from someplace and I just was <laughs> quiet. We got home. Uh, he pulls up to my car. I get up, grab my stuff, get out. And I don't, I, we probably talked like a week later or something like that. But those types of uh, moments where the emotion gets the better of you are frequent in golf. And it's easy to indulge yourself in them. But beyond just those types of moments, when we talk about embarrassment or something like that, it's easy to have something in a round go wrong or like have an entire area of your game not performing the best. And I think that's where the concept of the two thirds rule that you have is useful. Would you mind telling us a little bit more about that and how people can kind of keep that in mind as they're playing around? Cause it's been useful for me when I'm playing, I'm like, okay, like something goes wrong. Like, that's fine. Like something's got to go wrong today. Like I just got to, I got to stay in it and like manage it the best I can. So the, the two thirds rule is one of like the earliest blog posts I wrote on practical golf. And to this day is, I think it's been probably the most influential piece of advice I've ever given. So the idea is that if you split golf into three phases, you know, tee shots, approach shots, and what I would call finesse shots, a hundred yards and in. So that's wedges and putter. Um, my belief is that I don't think I've aside from, you know, maybe Jim Furyk's 58 or like some of like those crazy rounds of golf we've seen. I've never really seen anyone like truly conquer all three phases of the game in one round. So my belief is, is that you could shoot your best scores with two out of three things going well. So for example, the other day I, I had a great, yeah, my, my driver and irons were just perfect but I was on Bermuda greens down in North Carolina. <laughs> I could, I just, as a, as a Northeasterner, like just couldn't make a putt. It was just totally dumbfounded with the grain. Um, I still shot a good score. I think I was one under, but I was like, damn, that really could have been like a six or seven. Like I could have torched that place. Um, again, I played great golf and those two parts of my game carried me through the day. Um, sometimes the putter gets hot and then you're getting up and down and you're hitting good iron shots, but you're struggling off the tee. Um, so I just find that no matter what level of golfer you are, 25 handicap scratch, um, you can shoot your lowest scores with only two out of three parts of your game feeling comfortable. So what that means is you don't go out with the expectation, expecting everything to work well, because I think the trap golfers fall into is that, you know, you play a few holes, you hit a few bad shots and you're like, oh, this is, this day is not going to go well. And you give up hope and you're, you're kind of, your grit is, is disappearing. Um, so that's been helpful to a lot of people. And I think, you know, shooting your average scores only takes really one out of three parts of your game to be going really well. And my belief is, is that eliminating the zero days is where a lot of golfers see progress. And that's with a lot of the tools that I talk about, which is, you know, I think you can manage your way around the course with smart targets, being positive mentally, having grit and accessing all these uh, you know, tools um, to prevent the zero out of three days. Because the hardest thing to do for most golfers is when they feel uncomfortable with their swing, they kind of give up. 
And I, again, yeah, that that's your decision. But in the context of being the best player you can be, you really want to grind a little bit harder to turn that zero out of three into one out of three. Um, so that's the long and short of the two thirds rule is that you can play great golf uh, without perfection. And, and I don't, I really don't think it's, it's possible for 99.9% of players. I get that. I think for me, one of the things I have noticed just all in all, especially from looking at your stuff again, uh, not to fly to you, reading your book was very useful for me. And I actually gave it to my boss because I was like, you need to read this. Like the expectation, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> the expectation management is so important important for everything and as far as like that two-thirds rule that's part of expectation management and i think that's part of how my game compared to like 10 years ago when I, when someone shot like 66 or 67 at the time you've never done it personally and you're like how does somebody do that they must have had a day where they hit everything perfectly they must have had just they must have quote unquote careered it like everything had to go right for the hat to happen and then when you're actually around those guys i play with Again, we play with a lot of guys that play professionally, and the thing you realize about it's so boring. Yeah, it's it's not it's special. So like, boring. I f- I finished the round the other day with the guy, and like, again, if it were if it what most people wouldn't even have an idea that he shot five or six under, but like just because I can kind of, I'm again, I didn't even count his strokes. I'm like, hmm, that felt that felt more like a sixty seven. Like, is that about what you shot? He's like, yeah, sixty six. And but if you weren't like really like. Noticing those things, you think, oh, he shot 72 because it just wasn't spectacular. There's a birdie here, a birdie there, maybe a bogey where it could have gotten a whole lot worse and then just stay in the course and a few things rolling downhill the right way. Yeah, I mean, now now being on both sides of it, I remember the first time I played with a scratch golfer, I had the same reaction. I'm like, you know, he shot like probably 68 or something. And I'm like thinking back, I'm like, it was just a bunch of straight drives and, you know, some two putts for birdies and par fives and yeah, maybe made a 12 footer in there. Um, whereas my round at that point was this dramatic, like, you know, how many were going into the woods, like me losing my temper. Whereas like now, yeah, like fortunately I've gotten to my game to that level where it looks very boring and people are like, you know, what did like, what did you, yeah. They're like, what'd you shoot? And I'm like, oh, I think it was two under. It was just, they're like, what the hell even happened? It was, it was just, that and the, the the real takeaway from that that better golf is mostly mistake avoidance. It's it's really removing those uh oh swings. Like I can tell you the difference when I play with like a two or three handicap now versus like a true like scratch or plus golfer. The difference isn't like the spectacular shots they hit. Of course, you know the better golfer is going to flag it a few times or hit some like really prodigious drives. But it's the uh oh swings. The three handicaps gonna out of nowhere like hook one into the trees or you know, maybe chunk one, and the scratch golfer's not going to do that. Or if they do do it, they recover very nicely. Like that the better golfers very rarely hit two bad, what I would call bad shots in a row. Um, and that's an important lesson for any any level of golf because most golfers think, you know, well, if I gotta get to them a 20 to a 10. I got to make a lot more birdies. I got to hit more spectacular approach shots. And unfortunately, the game doesn't work that way. It's not that exciting. It really isn't. And when you can under truly embrace that and play that, yeah, you know, I, I always tell people a lot of my advice is very like boring and not sexy, but it is the path to lower scores because it's acknowledging that. And I'm trying to reduce your double bogeys and turn them into bogeys. So maybe that's a few times you punch out of the trees or you pick a smarter target with your irons rather than going for the pin. Um, yeah, better golf, unfortunately, isn't that exciting. It's boring, but ha- it is exciting posting the lower scores for sure. Like you feel a lot better about those. That's the exciting part. There's nothing that feels better than just doing your job. I think, at least to me, like doing your job, like gritting it out. And then all of a sudden you get to look up at the end of the day and you're like, you know, like I didn't have, I didn't do anything special. I didn't have to like, make the buzzer be your three. I didn't have to throw the Hail Mary. Like you just kind of beat it to death and that's easy to do. Or it's not easy to do, but like when it happens on the golf course, it's a rewarding feeling and it's nice to have that positive reinforcement. Um, Yeah. I get a lot of satisfaction of what I would call manufacturing scores on days where I'm maybe struggling with my swing. Um, I know a lot of people like to strike it well and I do too. 
but those are the days where, you know, where maybe I was going to shoot a 79, I can turn into a 75. And for a lot of golfers, it's the 102 that turns into a 97. Like that's how your handicap gets lower. It's on the days where you're maybe a little un- more uncomfortable or you're, maybe your temper is getting a little shorter. Your tension span is is not there. Like those are the days where you can kind of dig in a little bit more manufacturer score. And that's yeah, in the context of getting better, like those are some days that you're going to need to have versus, you know, if you just kind of throw in the towel mentally, like, yeah, you're not going to score as better like that. That to me is the great struggle of golf. It's almost it's, it's essentially a struggle against myself. That's why I've always liked it. I get that. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to join us today. As I said earlier, kind of hinted this. The last question we ask every guest is if you go back to yourself as a junior golfer and tell yourself one thing, what would it be? And then for you, since you do a lot more on the, um, you know, playing teacher side, what would you tell a junior golfer now? Hit it really damn far. Um, no, <laughs> no that, that'd be one thing I'd tell them, but everyone's telling them that. Um, I honestly just express gratitude for the ability to get to play this game because at some point in your life, as you get older and you you know, if you're graduating college, you're going into the workforce, you get married, you have kids, um, that abundance of time and ability to play is going to become more and more um, scarce. So I think gratitude is one of the greatest thing a golfer at any stage of their journey can have is, is just being grateful that you get to be out there, you know, playing this game, being outside, being with your friends and having that shared experience. Like it's a, you know, I feel bad for people who look at golfers like they're weirdos. Like this is a really special game and it's done so much for my life, you know, professionally and, and, and outside of my profession. Um, I would go back to the junior golfer who maybe was throwing temper tantrums and was expecting too much of himself and just being like, Hey, just be happy you're out there and you could do this. Um, so yeah, I would say gratitude would be my main message to that younger player. That's beautiful. Well, we appreciate you taking the time. As far as social media, your book, et cetera, where can people find all that stuff, learn more about you, hear you and support you? Best thing you could do is buy my book. I think it'll turn your game around quite profoundly. If I can toot my own horn, it's uh, just search for Foundations of Golf on Amazon and a few other retailers. Um, hopefully the audio version of the book will be out by the time this episode comes out. Um, my sweet spot, I'm uh, sorry, my podcast, which I co-host with Adam Young is The Sweet Spot. You can find my website, practical-golf.com. And I'm very active on Twitter. So if you want to chat, you can find me at Practical Golf. Thanks for joining us today. Please do us a big favor. And like and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts so we can help others learn how to play better tournament golf. You can find us online at thetournamentcode.com, on Instagram at thetournamentcode, and on Twitter at tournamentcode. As always, feel free to reach out to us at those places or email us at daniel at thetournamentcode.com and cooper at thetournamentcode.com. We hope you join us as we continue to dive deeper in what it takes to play elite tournament golf.